joining us for River Landing Conversations. I'm here today with my co-host, Jim Kalaki, and we have our special guest, Jimmy Plowden. Welcome, Jimmy. Thank you. You're welcome. So, can you tell us just a little bit about your life path, about how you have come from birth to eventually be here? Well, I was born in Sumter, South Carolina. My father um, was an insurance salesman. My mother was a fifth grade teacher. I, um, she taught for a while and then um, she got pregnant with me and my father didn't want her to teach while I was a young boy. Um, as you can tell, I was, well, my mother never would say I was a mistake. She always said I was a last minute thought. <laughs> but you know, when, when your birthday is June the 19th and your mother turns 45 uh, on August the 4th, you were not part of Planned Parenthood. <laughs> so um, anyway, I have two older brothers. My oldest brother's deceased. He um, is a, was a retired Air Force man. He was a, retired as a brigadier general. He, uh, my next brother is, he is 87 and is essentially dying now of Parkinson's disease in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And um, that's essentially who my family consisted of have lots of great aunts and uncles, all of whom are deceased. I'm sort of my brother and I, sort of the last of the- Last of the lot. Of the lot, mm -hmm. right. What was it like growing up in Sumter? Well, Sumter was a small town, and um, um, I, I had a good life in Sumter, South Carolina. I then went on to college uh, at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. Um, applied to medical school the first time, did not get in. Went to work for the State Board of Health, worked in the um, virology lab for three years, and decided chest, test tubes were not my way of wanting to live my life. So I applied to medical school again and got in. So I went to medical school in 1969, and graduated in 1973, and my father said, praise God, that boy's going to work. <laughs> and I said, no, Daddy, I want to be an internist. And so I moved to, um, from Charleston, South Carolina, where I went to medical school, to Augusta, Georgia, and did my internal medicine training for three years. And then Daddy thought, oh, he's, he's, Nang's going to work. Well, no, Daddy, I want to be an oncologist. So um, then um, I moved to Atlanta and did a two-year oncology fellowship and um, then moved to High Point after that with two guys that I actually trained with. They were interns when I was a second-year resident. So they had two more years of internal medicine to do and I had my two years of oncology to do in Atlanta. So we all came out at the same time and we all had worked well together and decided that we wanted to work together. And I actually signed a contract to go to Gastonia. And Nelson Pollock had decided he was coming to High Point. And he and I just kept talking and kept saying it's a shame we can't work together. And anyway, to make a long story short, he said, if you'll come to High Point with me and look, I'll go to Gastonia with you and look. So we did, we spent a weekend here, we spent a weekend in Gastonia. Um, had a wonderful time out, there's a surgeon, his name's Tommy Knife in High Point, and with he and a wonderful party of doctors at his home, and just fell in love with High Point, and Gastonia was very kind to me and said that they had rather me not come. They did not want an unhappy oncologist in their community. So they let me out of my contract and came to High Point. Where you were a happy oncologist. Well, I have been. I have been a happy oncologist. The thing that was sort of crazy is that the three of us, you know, 
we have been used to, in training, you do all these things, and you know, you do paracentesis, and you do thoracentesis, and you do bone marrows, and, and you do spinal taps, and all of a sudden, we came to town and we realized, well, you know, as a spinal tap, you charge a dollar for it. I mean, we had no idea <laughs> about running the front part. We knew how to take care of people in the back, but we had no idea of what to do with the front of the mm -hmm. office. So Nelson Pollock and I took off a week and went and spent in Atlanta, Georgia with this group of, I don't remember the name of them now, but people that basically taught young doctors how to not only mm -hmm. the size of your exam rooms, but what things were currently worth in your area, what, what a spinal tap should go for and what this should go for. And so that's sort of the way we got on our feet. Interesting. Um, which was pretty stupid, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. There were groups of doctors that were sort of betting we wouldn't make it. But <laughs> somehow, through the grace of God, we did make yeah. it. And, um, Has that changed in, in medical training now? that there's, there is a sort of how to run a business section of it, like courses or things? Well, when we came through, there was nothing like that. Yeah. The only thing that they cared about when we were in medical school, did you know how to take care of the people in the back? Yeah. And as far as the running of the front of the office, nothing was ever told about that. We were never told anything, I, I think, I, I have no proof of this, but. I think if we'd all been told more about what our lives would be like, like you know, you pick to be an internist, well, you're on call all the time. The phone mm -hmm. rings day, night, weekend. Whereas, you know, you, you, nothing against my dermatology friends, but you know, there are not many emergency pimples in this world, you know? Yes. Um, so, you know, the phone doesn't ring and they get good night's rest. Yeah. and. But you know, you're never taught any of that sort of stuff. You're just taught about what you think you like and what you think you would like to spend your life mm -hmm. doing. And then you get out in the real world and you learn what your real life's gonna be like. Um, which in some ways was a shock. Of course, medicine's changed so totally now yeah. um, compared to <clears throat> at least the way it was when we came through. And is that, has the training changed in terms of, um, you know, what to expect? Well, or, you know, when, when we trained, um, you know, you went to work and you left work when your work was through. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, now they, they're certain you can only spend so many hours on the floor and then you have to leave. Um, it just wasn't true back in our day. And you know, the wards, particularly every, um, out of every year, like uh, of the three years of internal medicine I did, you're given four months of wards, and those are just horrific times in your life. You're on call every third night. That meant you went to work one morning at seven o'clock, and you worked that night, you worked all the next day until your work was completed, and you went home and you died, and for sleep, I mean, you literally yes, died. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you, um, then you had a night off, and then you started that whole thing over. So those months of wards were just really hard on us. That's not allowed anymore. Um, a little bit more humane. It is certainly more humane. I, I worry about the training, though. I just was just so much I think that you learn by having to stay in that hospital mm -hmm. and so much that happens when um, you're not there. Yeah. Um, and without that experience, I, 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 I like the way I was trained, even though I would prefer to have been trained this way. I think we were trained quite well back mm -hmm. in our day. When you think of High Point in, when you came there and into the 70s and stuff like that, um, what are some 
highlights or fond memories that you have of? Well, people were so accepting when I first came. Yeah. And, you know, I did have trouble initially starting my practice. As I said, I, you had to be an internist before you could be an oncologist. So when I first came, most of the cancer patients were, um, you know, they were already farmed out to oncologists. And most of them didn't want to change. You know, they get attached and mm -hmm. that's where they want to stay. So for a while, I had to use my internal medicine training to make a living. So um, it took me probably a year and a half before I was able to switch over and do nothing but oncology. Probably the biggest shock was to, um, you know, of course the hospital wasn't set up for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I ordered drugs, chemotherapy that, that those nurses had never heard of, much less given. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the first time I ordered, it was a lady, dear, dear lady with breast cancer, and I ordered cytoxin methotrexate and 5-FU for her. Well, you would have thought I had written arsenic and several other drugs <laughs> to be given to the ladies, to the lady. The nurses were just horrified. And um, of course, that particular day, I had to go over there and give those drugs myself because they just wouldn't give them. Mm -hmm. They were afraid of them. And slowly but surely, the hospital sort of caught on to the fact that being an oncologist, um, I guess the biggest thing I brought to High Point was all of those p oncology patients that were, were farmed out. You have to realize all those scans, all that blood work, all those x-rays, all of those things were also leaving High Point. Yeah. They weren't coming to our hospital. Mm -hmm. So before long, as my practice built, um, before long, not only did I have my own oncology nurse in the hospital, um, because they realized that would be prof profitable. I'm sure it had nothing to do with wanting to help Jimmy Flowers. <laughs> um, but then they, um, I wound up with my own floor where all the cancer patients were kept. And um, of course then, in the, in the cancer center was built. Did you end up having to do a lot of the training initially to bring people on on what they were needed to do? Well, you know, back when I first came, there was no such thing as an oncology nurse. Mm -hmm. So my first nurse, her name was Glenda uh, Smith, bless her heart, she's deceased now. I taught Glenda how to give chemo. Glenda became a great, great chemo nurse. And most of the um, nurses that subsequently followed Glenda, I had a lot to do with their training, but by that time, there was such a thing as an oncology nurse training program. So in the end, um, I would dare to say my final nurse, who was my nurse for probably 20 some odd years, Elaine Key, um, I probably did a lot of training of Elaine myself before she actually got into the training of um, the oncology nurse practice thing. But um, that was such a help to have those girls that when I wrote for a drug, they knew how to give it, they knew the side effects, mm -hmm. and they knew if they got into trouble what to do about it. Um, um, Jimmy, was there a large, in the, in the general area like Greensboro, and um, Winston, I guess, um, <clears throat> oncology community that was that you were able to connect with or become a part of. And yes, I was. I was very. There were. Um, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Oh, I, no, I'm not. I'm drawing it. I'm remembering it. <laughs> his name is Ken Carb. Ken was an oncologist in um, Greensboro, and when there were just people that were like needed radiation, or we did not have radiation therapy here at that time. And Ken was very kind to take those people from me, keep them hospitalized until they could get through with their radiation treatments, and then be sent back here to me. Um, 
the people at the at, at, um, Baptist Hospital, um, Milt Rabin and Carolyn Faree were um, very gracious in helping me with that. As, as I said, at the time we didn't have radiation here, um, which in talking about a gift to High Point and to the people of, of, of High Point was the gift of the radiation unit that was um, given by Dave Phillips in honor of his mother, Lillian Phillips, who had died of cancer, which just did so much to help those people, you know, to be in pain and to be sick at your stomach and have to drive from High Point to Greensboro or to Winston-Salem um, to get your treatment, to be able to come right here to our own unit. Um, I don't think Dave's ever been fully aware of what that money yeah. did in terms of the humanity of that mm -hmm. money. Um, it was well spent money, and it's, it's still named for his, the Lillian J. Phillips yeah. um, radiation unit is still down there. I love that phrase, the humanity of that money. I, well, hadn't, I hadn't heard it before, but it's, it, and it fits exactly what you're saying. Well, it, so it, it was truly a humane thing. It, yeah. it, he just, I don't think Dave has become a very dear friend, he and his wife Kay, and uh, I didn't know them that well at the time, and I certainly had nothing to do with Dave giving the money. I've mm -hmm. become friends of theirs since then. But I, he, it was Dave's idea. I don't know, I don't even know who approached him about it. Yeah. But it was a very, uh, very kind and nice thing for him to do. Yeah. Uh, from something that you mentioned earlier, before we had started our televising here, uh, the cancer center that is in High Point was evidently also a donation from several people. Well, well it, what they did was they, um, uh, um, they put up a list and they would say like, well, you could give this cancer library or you could give this elevator or you could give a room in the cancer center. And you know, say the rooms were $70,000 or the, the library room was $700,000 or, so they put, put it out that way. For the cancer center to be named for someone they initially asked um, $3 million. And everybody knew that Pauline Hayworth was a dear friend of mine. And um, she, um, as a matter of fact, I was at dinner with her one night. And I noticed she had this scarf around her. I probably shouldn't be telling this about her. But she had this scarf around her neck. And all of a sudden, the scarf fell, and I saw this huge knot on the side of her neck. So we were riding home, and I said, Polly, what's that knot on the side of your neck? Oh, it's just a garter. I said, Polly, that's not a garter. Anyway, long story short, she had a, a head and neck cancer that um, um, was not very pleasant. Wound up in the end taking her life. Um, but she and I became good friends, not because of the cancer. We were friends before she had cancer. But the hospital administrator, Jeff Miller, called me and said, Jimmy, would you mind telling Pauline that we've decreased the um, naming of the cancer center from $3 million to $2 million? So I said, now Jeff, I'm not asking Pauline for money. I don't mind relaying the message, but I'm not gonna ask her to give the money. So I did relay the money to her with the, what they had said, and of course she decided she was go give the money. And I'm sure if you're familiar with High Point, particularly High Point University, there's a lot of Hayworth names out there on those buildings and things. But she decided because she and her husband, Charles, had had cancer, that she would give the $2 million to have the cancer center named for her, her and him. Seems like a community of people who will really expend their energies in High Point talents. really is great about taking care of its own and about 
raising money and getting things done mm -hmm. to, to help people. It's, um, it's been a great place to live. Um, I made a mistake about three years ago. You know, you get older and you think, oh, things are gonna be better somewhere else. So I moved to Greensboro, which was a horrible mistake. No, I don't have a thing against Greensboro. <laughs> It's just I had lived in High Point Absolutely. from 1978 to, I guess that was 2017 I moved. But it was, um, I should never have left High Point. So when did you officially retire? I retired um, in, <laughs> in 2006. Okay. Um, I actually told my partners that I would work until I was 63 and a half. And that way I could COBRA my um, insurance mm -hmm. until I could get 65. And um, they wound up one morning coming to me and made this deal with me that I could not refuse. They had found somebody to replace me that they really liked. and. Um, I never felt they were trying to get rid of me. Yeah. That was never the purpose. They just, it's hard to find somebody that you feel yeah. you can work with. And that was the deal. So the deal was that I um, actually quit when I was, I was 62 years old when I quit. And. Um, was that a hard transition? Yes, it, it, it was hard in terms of missing the people. I, um, I've never missed cancer. I've never missed the tears. I've never missed the, the death. I've, I've never missed any of that part of it. But I missed all the people that, um, you know, not only that you work with, but those, those patients become part of your family. You know, you, you um, I see, have seen people and, you know, and they'll come up to me and they know who I am, but you know, when people are dying, <clears throat> they bring in whole families. Yeah. There may be 20 people around that room, and yeah. all of a sudden, they can't believe that you don't remember, well, mama died, and you don't remember me, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. um, so it's sort of hard to, um, of course, they te usually tell me who they are, and I usually remember them. Yeah. If I don't remember them, my nurse, unfortunately, she remembers everything about everybody. <laughs> I could call Elaine and say, Elaine, tell me about so-and-so, and she would, would remind me. But no, I've never, I've never regretted quitting early other than the fact that I really did not have enough hobbies to, um, to um, fill the time. So did you find some? I did. I lived in a community um, before I moved to Greensboro. Um, where there was lots of gardening to be done. We had two um, master gardeners out there. And I did a lot of that with them. I love to cook, obviously. <laughs> I love to eat as well. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, we had a real great community. There were 16 little condos in this area. And um, I just took this wild thing about I wanted to move. And, I moved and it was wrong, and now I paid the price, and now I'm back. So anyway, but I did. Um, I never. I went to see. I don't know whether this is appropriate or not, but I went to see. I have. You always have these little people that are sort of the apples of your eye. That you know, they you'll teach us pet sort of thing. And I had three that I had that I knew were dying and. I asked that they call and tell me as they were dying, I would like to come see them. And when I went to see them, I noticed that they all just acted real strange toward me. It wasn't that they weren't glad to see me, it was just a, a distancing there mm -hmm. that I wasn't used to feeling from them. And then it was about two years later, I got a, a letter from this glorious black woman I had taken care of. And she wrote me a letter that really explained it all. She said, I just want you to know that it's taken me these two years to forgive you. 
She said, I could have understood if you were old. I could have understood if you were sick. But for you to quit and not have anything else to do other than to take care of us, I just want you to know I've forgiven you for it. Wow. Ooh. So I think it really, after just going and seeing those three, I never went to see another one after that. Mm -hmm. Because I, I knew there was something, and I think Doris in that letter sort of explained it to me that they were a bit peeved with me mm -hmm. for, for leaving them. And somehow felt abandoned. Exactly. Yeah. The same, I'm going through the same thing right now. The people that I've been, have been taking care of me now are all quitting. And, mm -hmm. Um, you know, you do, you feel, am I gonna like this new one? Is he gonna know as much as the other one? And right. That sort yeah. of thing. So it's, it's all frightening. Oh, interesting. Huh. So how, how did the transition from life outside of River Landing to River Landing happen for you? And, when, and how long have you... Have you you mean, how did I get to River yeah. Landing? Um, well, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> um, you know, we've, to, we've talked about Clark briefly, and um, um, I had a, a pretty major lung operation, and um, woke up some 18 days later to realize there was something wrong with him. And, um, um, the more we got involved, we learned that there was more and more wrong with him than just the one thing. Um, and as I've told you, I only have the one brother left, and he certainly can offer no help to me. I, if I were able, I ought to be there helping him, but he has a wife that can take care of him. Clark has no family. Clark was adopted, and his, he has a stepmother who lives in Winston. Um, but we don't really have anybody that would really stand up for us and mm -hmm. take care of us. And at that time, as I said, I was only 18 days away from a major lung operation and realized that all we needed, all this help. And there wasn't anybody to help us. So I immediately put money down at River Landing at Pennyburn and at Wellspring and had said the first place that offered us a place where we were going because we needed the help that badly. And um, incidentally, Pennyburn offered us a place. Wasn't two days later before Amy Rosen, I don't know whether y'all know Amy or not, glorious Amy Rosen. <laughs> Mr. Daly. Um, she called and said that she had a place. So then that sort of put us in a bind. What are we going to do? So anyway, long story short, the, world, the woman who was willing to give up her place at Pennyburn backed out. So as a result, we came to River Landing, mm -hmm. and we've been here since May. It was about the time all the COVID stuff started. We were supposed to move in, I think it was April the 4th of 2020. And I kept thinking the people that were buying our house from us in Greensboro weren't gonna move in until the 29th of May. So I kept calling Amy, saying, Amy, maybe this COVID stuff will go away and we don't have to deal. <laughs> Instead, it just got worse and worse and worse. So we actually moved in in um, the height of COVID, um, which was not a very pleasant time yes. to move. Right. Everything essentially, you know, at River Landing was pretty much closed. Mm -hmm. So in terms of just having an apartment that we lived in, that, um, that we stayed in for two weeks, the only thing they told us we could do, we could walk the dogs four times a day yeah. to the very end of the road and back. <laughs> So um, it was a 
Not a very good transition, yes, to be honest. Indeed, indeed. Um, but it would have been the same thing had we gone to Pennyburn, had we gone to Wellspring, you know. But we just knew that we needed the help. We were more than grateful to be here now and um, enjoying living. So it's taken an upswing. It has. Good. It has. Good. When, when we moved, it was it was not so much of an upswing. It was a, a it was a matter of necessity as well as we felt like we were in prison for two yeah. solid weeks, yes. Yes. you know, without being able to get out. And we, of course, still had stuff left in our house over in Greensboro, and we couldn't get out to do anything about it right. until those two weeks were over. So um, there we were in that apartment with nothing but boxes and, um, and dogs. And dogs, yeah. they always <laughs> enjoy them. No, that they 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 were the joys. They were the joys. Right. Jimmy, if there, if you think of maybe about three people in all of time, and if all the boring details were taken care of, and you could have a chat with them, who who might they be, and why? You're talking about my patients, you know. No, no, just, well, anyone in the sweep of history. From beginning of time to Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know. Um, you know, I know everybody expects you to say somebody like JFK or, or Jesus or... I guess number one would be my mother. Um, you know, my mother lived the last eight years of her life essentially as a, a little birdling in a nest. Um, it put food down her mouth and her mouth would open. And that was about the way she lived the last eight years. I'd love to talk to her about, because um, so much of that time when I was in training before her Alzheimer's came about, wasn't really able to spend much time with her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm crazy about famous people. Fame fascinates me. Um, I think this lady's quite controversial, but I think she's beautiful. I love to see her. I have seen her one time. Um, but I think she did a lot of good for what she did. Her name's Elizabeth Taylor. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I collect things that have belonged to famous people, and I fortunately bought something from her collection when they sold it. She did a lot for what she believed in. She did a lot for AIDS. She made AIDS acceptable. She made AIDS a real disease and um, that people aren't to be fragmented and put in cells mm -hmm. and um, kept away. Um, who would be a third one? think of a third one, I have a question. You mentioned you have things you have collected from famous people. Could you share what some of those things are? Um, yeah, um, well, as I said, I, I bought, uh, it's, it's um, I, I think it's probably brass. It's a like vase-like thing that I bought from Elizabeth Taylor's auction. Um, I have an urn that belonged to um, Stephanie over there <laughs> won't, re won't even know who I'm talking about when I say George Burns and Gracie Allen. Oh. She, oh. Yeah. Do you know who they are? No. <laughs> I knew she wouldn't. But anyway, so things okay. like that. Uh -huh. um, I have a couple of paintings. That, one painting that belonged to Lauren Bacall. Another mm -hmm. one that belonged to um, Catherine Hepburn. Um, I have some um, uh, terrain and things that were in the White House when um, JFK and Jackie O were there. 
Um, I have a little Tiffany thing that it belonged to. Um, back up, see you, Mama. Um, it was a real famous actor back in the 50s. Um, I had a ring, but I was so proud of it. I actually got stolen in my move here. Um, it had been a ring that belonged to Clark Gable. Clark Gable and Lana Turner were having an affair during their um, um, making of their fourth movie. And um, I actually have the picture of them dancing with Clark Gable we wearing the ring. But that got missing in my move here. Um, I don't have that much. Okay. It's just interesting pursuit. It's just yeah. Yeah. little things that say, uh, to me, it just sort of fascinates me about, I wonder who all has been around that particular uh -huh. place. Yeah. What particular per group of people have been around? Yeah. Or if that, if that vase could talk. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> could tell me some yes. stories that, that <laughs> went on beyond these things. But um, um, I guess another person that, that I, as I said, I love performers. Um, I love to talk to Diana Ross. Um, I've heard she's um, not one of God's nicer human beings. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I hope it's okay for me to tell this. I have a friend that lives in New York, and he um, happened to be having lunch at a table next to her. And he knew that I loved her, and so he asked the waiter, said, would, he said, would you mind asking her for an autograph for him? And the waiter's response was, I'd rather ask a rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, long story short about that was that Gus happened to be going in the men's room and coming out of the men's room, and Diana Ross was coming out of the ladies' room. And he just said, excuse me, Miss Ross. And so he told a lie. He said, I have a friend that's real sick. He said, well, he just loves you. Would you sign a, an autograph for him? And she said, well, I don't have any paper. And then she turned around and said, well, if you come to the desk with me, I'll sign it for you. So he said she could not have been nicer. And she wrote this thing, it just says to Jimmy Platt and Diana Ross, um, but said she talked about North Carolina and how she loved the mountains of North Carolina and how one day that she had planned to actually own a home in the mountains of North Carolina. Anyway. That's enough about Diana Ross. <laughs> so is Motown some of your favorite music? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I've, you know, Gladys Knight has been twice over at the Tanga Center. I've been mm -hmm. twice to see her. Um, you know, all of the, the, the divas, the, the Aretha Franklins, the Dionne Warwicks, the Patti LaBelle's, all those, um, that's my kind of yeah. music. Um, you know, the Four Tops, the Temptations, yeah. yep. all of those people, you know. I, I, I don't understand rap. Um, so um, you can mark that off my list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably most of ours. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story and some of the history of medicine developing here in High Point, and um, we really appreciate your time. And I hope that all of you listening will tune, out, ne tune in next week and join us for another edition of Riverlanding Conversations. Thank you.